sind, sind so aus dieser, wir haben ja 2010 diese Konferenz jenseits des Wachstums gemacht. Das war meine letzte große Attacktat. Und da sind einige quasi, die jetzt hier auch eine ganz zentrale Rolle spielen. So, so, da bin ich also Wachstum. Ja, klar. Und da kommt was. Aber nicht krass. Ich bin der mit der nächsten Legislaturperiode als Staatssekretär in der Schwarz-Grün-Koalition. Ja, ja. Ich weiß nicht, ob ich auch nicht Hello and good evening. more good evening welcome to our panel discussion this evening on the question of what the German Parliamentary Commission on growth has achieved and how to continue with these achievements my name is Angelika Zand I will be the, the chair of this panel I'm an economist and I was um, the director of Friends of the Earth Germany for many years and I've worked in recent years on uh, the theme of sustainability and on growth and sufficiency. And so I have a certain affinity to the subject pursued by the German Parliamentary Commission on growth. The full name of the uh, Parliamentary Commission is Growth, Prosperity and Quality of Life, Roads, um, to w progress in the social landscape. The work of the German Parliamentary Commission on Growth are the subject of today's, today's discussion event. The discussion will be conducted in German, but there are simultaneous translations into English and into Spanish. If you should have any difficulties, uh, technical difficulties, um, receiving the signal of the translation, it helps to wave the receiving device in the air and perhaps then that will improve your receipt of the signal. The English translation is on channel 2 and the Spanish translation in channel 3. Um, we're, we have about two hours for this discussion. Uh, we're going to uh, spend uh, an hour uh, debating the issue on the panel and then we will open up the discussion and ask all of you in the audience to participate. Um, there's one 
a remark concerning matters of organization that I would like to make. You've probably noticed that everything is working wonderfully at this conference and that there are many helpers who are working very effectively. Nevertheless, um, I've been asked to invite all of you to perhaps volunteer your services as a helper as well. That you can do that at the desk, desk um, just outside um, this auditorium on the right. But please don't do so now. You can do this after the discussion. This evening, we've uh, assembled a round of guests, all of the members of the German Parliamentary Commission on Growth. I would like to introduce them to you. Uh, first of all, I'd, of all, I'd like to introduce you to Daniela Kolbe. Uh, you'll notice that she's not physically present, even though her name appears in the program. And even though she is on the way to Leipzig, she's uh, on a train and the news is that she will probably not arrive in Leipzig until 9.30 p.m. And of course, we have to begin. We can't wait for her. But we thought that if she arrives before our discussion is over, we'll take, we'll give her an opportunity um, for her to uh, to speak. And we'll interrupt what we're, we're doing um, to um, give her the opportunity to say something about the results of the German Parliamentary Commission on Growth. It's also possible that she is listening to the live stream on the train, so perhaps she'll be up to date on what we're, say we're saying. I'll nevertheless introduce Daniela Kolbe. She's a physicist, and she was and is a member of the um, um, Social Democratic Party and representing that party in the German Parliament. She's uh, chairperson she was chairperson of the german parliamentary commission on growth and in this uh, legislative period she's working in the work group on issue labor issues and social issues we're also glad that professor dr matthias zimmer is here with us tonight he was uh, the vice chair of the parliamentary commission on growth and uh, he played a special role within this parliamentary commission. Um, he was the um, um, deputy of uh, Daniela Kolbe, and um, he's, um, he was uh, and is a member of the Christian Democrat faction of the German parliament, and um, he is also the vice chair of the work group on issues, labor issues, and social issues. Hermann Ott of the Green Party is also here with us. He was a member of the German parliament during the last legislative period, and he ran the project group within the Parliamentary Commission on Technological Progress. He's a lawyer and um, a climate scholar, and he's now working again at the Wuppertal Institute on Climate Change. Then we have Sabine Leidig, who has uh, been in the German Bundestag for the left party since 2009. She's the speaker on uh, traffic and transportation issues and now working in the work group on uh, urban issues. And she ran the project group number five on work, consumer behavior and lifestyles within the parliamentary commission. If you're missing a member of the Federal Democrat Party on this panel, or perhaps you're not missing them, I asked the organizers of this event about the absence of an FDP member, and their reply was that they wanted a constructive debate this evening. And since the representative of the Federal Democrat Democratic Party were uh, behaved in a very obstructionist manner within the Parliamentary Commission, we decided, or the decision was made, that we don't need to repeat this tonight. So to begin with, um, I have a general question, and then I've also prepared some more specific questions to the members of the Parliamentary Commission who are here with us tonight. I would like to ask you what your assessment is of the question of whether the German Parliamentary Commission on Growth uh, prompted a debate on growth within Parliament over and beyond the Parliamentary Commission itself, where the, de the debate, of course, was very intense. And will this debate 
be um, a long-term debate? And that's one question. And the other question is, has the work of the Parliamentary Commission led to the orientation toward growth becoming more pronounced in your own political party? Has it led to the search for alternatives um, being intensified? And with regard to our conference, I would ask you, is there a debate on something such as a post-growth society? Are people in your party thinking about um, degrowth? Let's see if this microphone is working. The microphone is on, so I hope everyone can hear me. Can you hear me? No. So I hope you can h hear me a little better now. I, th I think what the I think what the Parliamentary Commission on Growth has achieved is it has brought together various strands of debates that already existed. And I think the final report of the Parliamentary Commission will have an effect on the de larger debate within society. That, I think, has been the effect of this report that we have published. As far as the development of um, the debates in the uh, meetings of the Parliamentary Commission on Growth are concerned. One thing was remarkable, and that's something that perhaps is of interest to you here at this conference, namely the fact that there was no, no, um, there were no front lines between the various parties represented within the Parliamentary Commission, but the front lines ran across the party lines. So there were there were f front lines traversing the single parties. This concerned the left party, the Social Democratic Party, and the Christian Democratic Party. The only party that was not, as it were, internally divided was the Federal Democratic Party, and that perhaps explains why the Federal Democratic Party is absent uh, tonight, because the Federal Democratic on an un. Vor sehr unterschiedlichen Positionen kommen wir hinter Freiwillen des Wachstumsbegriffs, ob aus ökologischen Überzeugungen, aus christlichen Überzeugungen, aus Postwachstumsüberzeugungen, was auch immer, eigentlich dazu geführt hat, dass man sich den Zugehörigkeiten der Parteien nicht mehr so sehr versichern konnte, wie das sonst immer der Fall ist und dass das am Ende dazu führte, dass wir an vielen Stellen der Erkenntnis freien Lauf lassen konnten, gerade in der Arbeitsgruppe, die Herr Ort geleitet hat, und da vielleicht Ergebnisse produzieren konnten, die so in dieser Form, als die Enquete-Kommission eingesetzt worden ist, noch nicht absehbar gewesen sind. Ich möchte kurz darauf hinweisen, dass wir den Hinweis bekommen haben, dass wir nicht ganz so eine große Nähe zum Mikrofon haben sollten. Ich höre das ja hier, dass Sie sehr dezent und ruhig sprechen, aber es kommt äh, wohl übers Mikrofon lauter an, als das äh, akustisch so angenehm ist. <lacht> Gut, dann gebe ich das weiter also, an die Techniker. Sich ich werde das entweder verstanden oder übersetzt. Habe ich das richtig verstanden? So, so darauf scheint es hinauszulaufen. Um den letzten Teil Ihrer Frage zu beantworten, ich glaube, also zumindest ist von meiner Fraktion eine so Antwort. To reply to the last part of your question, there, it is of course very difficult to to bid farewell to an emphatic concept of growth, such as it has been cultivated in my own party for many years, and. There are issues such as the question of what is quality of life and what is a good life that my um, party is working on. There's an, an internal work group in my party that is addressing these questions. And the chancellery, the German chancellery, is addressing the question of what 
the good life might consist in, it wishes to thematize this question by means of um, ci um, citizens' conferences. And I'm confident that this will also involve raising questions about growth, about the consequences of growth, and about what we're willing to pay for growth. So the issue remains on the agenda. Thank you. Then. We'll proceed. Well, as far as the question is concerned of what the Parliamentary Commission has achieved over and beyond the members of the Parliamentary Commission itself, I can't really think of anything. Um, when I hear that you and your parliamentary faction have set up such a work group, I think that's wonderful. But as far as the debates in Parliament are concerned, I haven't had the impression that anything has happened anywhere, that anyone has made reference to the work of the Parliamentary Commission. So I don't share this optimistic assessment that our report, our final report, which is 800 pages long, is really having an, a larger effect on society. I think that we've had very little effect. Um, it's The report isn't really paid attention to by very many people. It's not read by many people. But I nevertheless believe that the work has a certain significance, mainly because the critique of growth has explicitly been made a subject of social debate. It, and it's been made a, a subject that can be debated within society. Now, that sounds as if one hadn't been able to debate it earlier on, but um, consider the fact that the German news daily Frankfurter Rundschau has um, produced a series of articles on the topic. Now, the fact that they've done this, I think, is due to the fact that the German parliament engaged with the subject. So in that sense, the theme, the subject is on the social agenda or on the agenda of society. I'm now working on issues related to transportation. And when I listen to the debates in that field, I have to say there is no, I have no sense of there being any sort of reticence with regard to issues of growth. And the only person who's saying that we need less transportation and this um, is a position that's rejected by all of my peers. They treat me as if I were crazy. There is still a sense that growth is equal to prosperity and that transportation is one element of prosperity. So there has been no questioning of this growth paradigm here. I think it's very much a question of what areas and what fields one is active in. I think the situation may be different in the field of environmental politics. I'm sure more questions are being raised th there. As far as my own parliamentary faction is concerned, I can say that we have had a, a very critical debate and the parliamentary commission was uh, something that prompted that debate. It was uh, something that prompted us to engage systematically with these issues and that's something that we did uh, in the last, um, during the, the last electoral period and we, uh, and um, we produced a paper with the title Plan B, um, the, the, the red thread for socio-ecological transformation. I think that's a, a very uh, a successful um, uh, piece of work um, that we produced there. And it's a, a text that addresses questions of distribution and makes the problem explicit with regard to four different areas. But a debate on growth and the critique of growth um, is something that, yes, keeps cropping up again and again. During the last electoral period, there was a very intense and controversial discussion on the question of how we wish to position ourselves with regard to um, ending the euro crisis. And there was a video clip that was uh, produced by members of our parliamentary faction um, who called for um, creating growth impulses for Europe and, and arguing that the European economy is being forced down onto its knees. And in the video clip, you could see airplanes and images like this. And I think we need a different kind of imaginary um, on the left than this. So that's something that I think needs to be said. To sum up, I don't see the Parliament as a whole having changed its position on the critique of growth. But 
um, uh, what I do see is that single people in all of the um, parliamentary factions have been, as it were, strengthened um, by the work of the German Parliamentary Commission on Growth, and that we have, in some points, found common shared positions. Hermann. Now, the, the theme of growth um, wasn't something that just developed all by itself, and, and it was something that involved a lot of work for the Green Party as well. Yes, um, that's true. Um, Matthias Zimmer, I think, was ex exaggerating slightly when he praised the successes and, and the great effect that the Parliamentary Commission ha has had. Um, I'm afraid the truth uh, is something different. But I have to say that personally, the Parliamentary Commission um, um, yielded a great deal of very positive results uh, for me. Um, the the commission was uh, um, consisted half of it consisted of members of the German Parliament and the other half consisted of experts scientific es experts and so this was this was a, a, a great form of uh, participation of civil society in parliamentary matters that we normally don't that normally doesn't exist and aside from the fact that, that Working with uh, really excellent uh, colleagues such as Dr. Matthias Zimmer, Daniela Kolb, and Sabine Leidig, apart from the fact that it's a pleasure to work together with them, my ex I have to say that my expectations were very limited. I wasn't expecting very much. And I remember a conversation I had with a colleague who said, Oh, I've already been in five or six parliamentary commissions on energy issues, and you mustn't expect your parliamentary commission to have great effect. The best thing you can expect to do is to clarify some question. And I think, think with regard to that, um, the German parliamentary commission uh, was successful. All the work groups uh, had a ca catalog of questions that they were tasked with uh, finding answers to. So there was a real sort of research program on the subject of post-growth. Uh, unfortunately, the, r the report that we prepared um, isn't very uh, accessible or hard to find. I, I bought this USB stick that has the text on it and also an English translation of the report. But I would say that even for people who were involved in writing this report, it's it's a not a very accessible text. It's difficult to read. The written text um, uh, that I the, the the printed version of the text that I have has um, all of the little almost index uh, as, as an index system um, where um, you can um, find all the passages that are relevant to specific themes. What um, the report has achieved, and this is something we can only see in r retrospect, is that it has increased interest in the topic. When we were members of the Parliamentary Commission, we were always complaining that the media were reporting on our work. We had a sense that we were working, as it were, uh, in some sort of... Uh, uh, hidden realm, no one was paying attention to us, but that has changed, and uh, the degrowth conference uh, is an expression of that. Um, but but um, th that changed, and all of the media reported on uh, our report when we published the report, and there was a great deal of media reporting on specific issues related to um, to the ecological limits of growth, to uh, and, and issues of this kind. So the work has of the Parliamentary Commission uh, uh, has initiated a process, which unfortunately, however, has as it were petered down or died away. As far as uh, the question of quality of life is concerned. Um, the, the chancellery uh, dis decided during the last legislative period to organize a dialogue on something called di future dialogues. So has anyone in this room heard about this? Well, yes, some people have, but by and large, it wasn't really paid much attention to. It didn't have much of an effect. And of course, what's also important is that there was a debate there, not just about the quality of life and about vague concepts, rather the economic foundations of, of what leads to um, quality of life. Um, was also addressed in our parliamentary commission, and I have the fear that in uh, future uh, debates on this issue, that will be ignored. 
there is there is even an a, um, an agreement within the governing coalition that the, the theme of indicators i.e the theme of whether to uh, use indicators such as gross national uh, product or other indicators that these uh, these methods that have been used so far should be uh, reconsidered. Uh, there's been an understanding that um, gross national product is not enough as an indicator that we also need to consider uh, social phenomena and ecological issues. Thank you. This is the English interpreter speaking. Could you please tell the panel that there cannot be good interpretation into English if the microphone is held that close to the mouth? Could, if anyone is listening in English, could you please tell the panel to hold the microphone less close to their mouth? Thank you very much. So do you, do you think there was a real debate on growth after the work done by the Parliamentary Commission. I feel that this debate was rather inflamed by civil society and not so much by the work done by the Parliamentary Commission. I also wanted to mention that here on the panel, everybody seems to be in agreement, more or less, which was not typical for the Parliamentary Commission while it was working. And I want to, to follow up on one point that was mentioned by Sabine Leidig, but also by Hermann Ott. The report, almost a thousand pages long, is maybe a bit too long and a bit hard to read. So isn't it clear that, of course, the public hesitates to re read it and hesitates to really um, get into the debate. All of those who've put uh, so much work into that commission and into the the report, has there been thought about what can be done in order to make sure that the report does not just rest on somebody's desk, and, but is actually being read by people who deal with degrowth, by scientists, that it can really be used as a basis for people's work and also for raising public awareness. Do you have any plans on this? So obviously you have to switch on the microphone, which I didn't know. We have decided on discussing again on the results of the enquete of the Parliamentary Commission in the framework of the government dialogue Good Life, if that ever comes about. We talked to the Chancellor about that, and we said that actually this would be a good opportunity for talking about the work of the Parliamentary Commission. Sabine Leidig was also present in the Chancellery when we came forward with that proposal. So in that government dialogue, we might have the opportunity to draw attention again to the report of the Parliamentary Commission. I'm actually myself not that pessimistic about the effect of the report, because I think many great pieces of literature have only had an effect centuries after they had been written. I don't think the report is ever going to make it to the top 10 list of of books sold in Germany. But I think everybody who's dealing with the topic of degrowth won't be able to avoid reading this report. I think, of course, the Parliament now has to deal with other topics, other problems, and there's very little opportunity to talk about the the knowledge that we've gained while working on the Commission. And uh, I myself am very 
happy every time there is such an opportunity like this panel tonight. Of course, when there's no liberal politicians present, I guess I am the next biggest enemy here for most of you on this panel. But such a debate, and I think it's important to say this, is a debate that will be held by all political parties. And of course, there will be opposition to this debate within all political parties. And this is exactly what makes the topic so interesting, because it contradicts many of the party political questions that you usually deal with. I have to admit that I did not do much to distribute the report either. But I think we keep working on this topic in our parliamentary group, for example. In this legislative period, we will keep on working on this parliamentary commission. And we are also cooperating with the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, which takes a more scientific approach to the whole topic. So I don't think the report is going to be forgotten. But I also have to admit that we don't always focus on parliamentary work, because Because, of course, it's more difficult to work and agree in a broad parliament than it is within a political party. So we are always trying to find out with whom we can forge alliances in order to influence the political process. What I'm hoping for is that there won't just be the general sorts of commitment to growth, criticism, and uh, alternative approaches. We saw this in the Parliamentary Advisory Council on Alternative Development. But if we look at who is on this council, and it's mostly new MPs, and also considering the fact that the, the recommendations by such a by such a commission do not have much effect on um, parliamentary work, then we'd really have to look into what are the political topics that are being discussed and in how far do they match the proposals and the work done in the parliamentary commission. Unfortunately, this is something that I don't see much at the moment. I hope it's going to change. Like all of the others, I have written a couple of articles on this topic. And um, as, you, as you probably know, Uwe Schneiderman, the president of the Wuppertal Institute, was also a member of um, the Parliamentary Commission. And together with him, I'm trying to integrate the findings of the commission into our work. However, I can tell you that it is really difficult. Within one legislative period, you will find a few people dealing with such a topic, and then from time to time they are talking about the rebound effects. I've been nicknamed Mr. Rebound even, because every time I uh, spoke up in Parliament, I had to say something about the rebound effect, so they gave me that nickname. And then you have the report on it, and and maybe also within the, your parliamentary group, there's a discussion about it. But after that, you get a bit tired, of course. And it's, it's tiresome to try and include the findings of the parliamentary commission into your parliamentary work. Within the Green Party, we have a working group called Transformation. And they are also dealing with questions of growth and prosperity. and I'm following closely their work. But they also have to fight to raise their, their voices within the whole parliamentary system. I don't know if you read the book by Walter House. 
he um, attended parliamentary sessions every day for a whole year, and he was writing a book about what he experienced while doing that. And when you read this book, you will understand of how the daily, daily events sometimes just overshadows the, the long-term goals that we actually have. There is a, is a kind of institutional, institutionalization. And I think this is something that we'd also need in civil society. What I notice within the community is that there is such a distance felt between the people and what happens in Parliament. People feel that MPs are not dealing with their issues really and people decide to do their own thing. And I think, I think it's up to the civil society to increase pressure on the individual MPs. Because only if there is pressure by civil society groups, political work will change. Okay, so we had two rounds on a more general assessment of the work of the Parliamentary Commission. And I wanted to go into more detail now. There was the central question of the prosperity indicator. According to the statistical, the office for Federal Office for Statistics, there will be new indicators for growth. In the future, also illegal economic activities like weapons smuggling, for example, will, will be included in GDP, which will lead to an, to an increase in GDP, maybe especially in Italy. But I think you've given these prosperity indicators a bit more thought, maybe we should assess it on a different basis. And you have proposed an additional set of indicators. Mr. Zimmer, I wanted to ask you, whether you could please explain a bit more this new set of indicators and what hope, what hopes you've put into it. With regard to the national sustainability strategy, for example, a whole new set of indicators has already been set up. So could you compare maybe? And I also want to ask Sabine Leidig and Hermann Ott, How do you judge this proposal by the Parliamentary Commission? Do you think it's a good one? How do you assess it? And do you see any chances for for, for really implementing this, this new set of indicators? Or do you want to include even other indicators? Or maybe you even feel that because of the work of the Parliamentary Commission and the results it has, there is less talk about changing the set of indicators. So let me start with one comment on um, the new set of indicators that will be applied from the 1st of September on. From the 1st of September on, those smoking wheat will help to increase GDP. I think this is funny in a way. So our main aim in changing the set of indicators, which back then consisted mainly of the indicator GDP. But we felt that this indicator did not really reflect quality of life for people. So we tried to come up with one figure, 
because we, th we thought that was necessary. Also, people who did not know much about politics would need to understand it immediately. GDP is something that can be understood easily by many people. When they say there's growth of 0.3%, everybody seems they understand it. Everybody thinks they understand it. But if we include economic, social, and sus sus sustainability indicators, then, of course, we won't come up with... This won't result in us having one figure that represents growth. So there'll be a set of indicators, as I said. And I'm telling you honestly that this is a very diff difficult thing to, to convey to people. Because it makes growth indicators so much more difficult to compare. How do you want to compare growth in Germany to growth in France or other countries then? There are way too many sets of indicators available. And we cannot hope that our set of indicators will, will impose itself on, on an international level. So I don't think it was the main task of the Parliamentary Commission to come up with a new set of indicators anyway. I think the main task of the Parliamentary Commission was to raise awareness for the whole topic of growth and to to raise the question of whether growth is really our indicator for measuring quality of life. And I think the Enquete Commission has delivered on that in many ways. But I'm afraid that our set of indicators will probably be forgot forgotten more easily than, for example, the findings that we came up with on um, on other matters. But just to be clear on this point, it was the task of the Parliamentary Commission to develop a holistic and sustainable growth indicator, or rather a set of indicators. So. You had planned to to work on this, hadn't you? Well, I think th you will often find that when you work, the results you come up with might be might be different from what you expected. This also happens in in scientific work. I've written a lot of scientific papers, and I sometimes found that they developed in a different way than I had intended. But to be honest, I felt that this indicator will not prevail over the other indicators proposed. So am I getting you right? You don't really defend this indicator with a lot of passion, do you? No, I don't. Interestingly, um, the whole period of when the Parliamentary Commission was working for a whole two years, I was working in another work group. I had the impression that the majority of the people in this project group didn't really want any other criteri criterion or any other political criterion. They simply... They, they simply decided to add perhaps another indicator and perhaps another indica indicator so that in the end w w there was the risk of us ending up with a, a chaotic ensemble of different indicators. What we wanted was to develop indicators that would be a genuine um, index of whether or not politics is developing in the right direction. Um, and uh, what we were thinking of mainly there was um, the, the social development of, of society and the effects of what society is doing on the ecology. And in taking that position, we were very far removed from the majority view. And it's also the case that even today, the political decision makers could easily say that 
we could easily decide to choose or opt for other indicators, other criteria of whether they're be acting well or not. There is um, the, the sustainability, uh, there's a set of uh, sustainability indicators, a very differentiated uh, system of indicators telling us where things are becoming critical, where things are working well. And um, people like the economic minister could easily decide to orient themselves to these indicators or to make use of these indicators in assessing their work. Well, when you've spoken to experts outside of the Parliamentary Commission, when you spoke to experts outside the Parliamentary Commission, you got two completely contrary views of what uh, concerning these indicators. Some people said that's just utter nonsense, and some and others said no, that's actually the key issue. If you do something on this, um, if you do something about these indicators, you can really make a difference. And and um, the. There was there was a um, the, the what what has been called a, a chaos of indicators, um, a, an, a, a collection of twenty indicators was something that the the Christian Democrats and the FTP and the, and the Social Democratic Party were thinking about, and we in and in the Green Party thought that this was nonsense. We were in favor of developing a clear and easily understandable system of indicators. And so, similarly to the people in the left party, we, um, we uh, settled for a system of three indicators. Actually, that was the left party. We had four indicators, it was something we called the prosperity quartet. Not the prosperity quartet. We called it the prosperity compass. And this was based on the idea that we weren't thinking of something like a GPS navigating device where you, you tell the device where you want to go and it tells you exactly where you need to go. We, we, wanted, uh, we wanted a compass, a compass, something that gives you a sense of being, of moving in the right direction. And so um, we had an, an indicator uh, of social justice, um, which um, concerned the relationship of the upper 20% of society to the lower 80%. And we had a, a subjective indicator of an indicator of happiness, if you will, where we would simply ask people how they feel. And this indicator is important um, in r making people in, in raising people's interest, trust, because of course you can hold lectures on indicators and you can um, present a lot of figures, and but you'll probably just bore people to sleep. But if you talk about a happiness indicator, then everyone's interested. I have a slightly different perception um, than um, what Sabine uh, said concerning the motivation of the members of the Parliamentary Commission. I feel that there was a great deal of interest, uh, is particularly among the, the experts, the scientific experts in the Parliamentary Commission, in developing a new system of indicators. And uh, in the Christian Democratic and uh, um, Social Democratic Party, there was a, a there was an ag agreement that you would need a different set of indicators uh, on an indicator for biodiversity, an indicator for the effects of certain actions on the environment. But one of the insights that I had in this parliamentary commission is that it wasn't the politicians who had trouble agreeing with one another. It was actually the scientific experts, the professors, um, who were at pains to not agree uh, with one another, who were always bickering. Um, that led to utter disagreement within project group number one, which ended up presenting not one but two final reports. And it, um, what I saw was, was sort of doc doctrinal views um, that clashed with one another, and it was utterly impossible for these experts to find a consensus or a compromise. But at least we were able to uh, recognize these three indicators as important next to um, in, or in addition to uh, the, the already uh, uh, common indicator that is gross national product. Well, you, you've, you've presented it as a kind of, of fundamental consensus and made it seem, seem very harmonious. But 
I have a sense that there were very different proposals that were made, and I'm not sure the system of indicators was really intended or had the effect of be presenting a sort of consensus. But I think it's become clear that, that the the, the uh, long-term um, value of this indicator is probably not as great as, as that of some of the other results of the parliamentary group's work. And so I would now like to address a different issue. Um, I was wondering whether you could perhaps tell us something about the results of the project group that you worked in and, of, and about the political um, consequences that would need to be uh, um, drawn from the work of this work group. And I wanted to ask Daniela Kolbe what she thinks about what she said one year ago, namely that one uh, has agreed on the nature of the rebound effect, astoundingly, but that the consequences um, weren't, uh, it wasn't possible to actually implement the, the, the consequences within the governing coalition of the time. And you, um, Dr. Atsuma, um, um, what, what, what do you think? Um, D D Daniela Kobe said it wasn't possible to um, implement uh, the lessons learned in, in the governing coalition at the time, but we now have a different uh, governing coalition. And do you think there, there might be agreement within the governing coalition that this is a subject that needs to we need to continue working on? Well. Um, in English, um, uh, there's a story where there's a 900-pound gorilla in the room and no one can see him. There's a huge problem and everyone is talking around it. And that's sort of the situation with this rebound effect. The rebound effect has been known f for a long, long time. It's been known, since, uh, known about since 1865, but very few people are paying any attention to it. As a colleague of mine... I pointed out there is a there is a, a little bit a bit of literature that is uh, published on the rebound effect in sort of scholarly circles, but it doesn't really receive much attention. But um, the, the one of the main insights in all of the parliamentary, uh, all of the MP among all of the MPs represented in the parliamentary commission was that if we want to, uh, if we don't want to overstep the ecological limits of our planet, then we we need to. Uh, we need to reduce um, uh, we need we need to reduce carbon dioxide emissions across the planet not just in industrialized countries and we learned that this is difficult because of this rebound effect that's something that one can observe very uh, clearly when looking at uh, automobile technology car technology today is all is very much different from what it was in the 50s but um, cars are still consuming um, much the same as they used to. And that's because technological progress has been used to make the cars larger, more comfortable, and so on. And so there hasn't been a net gain in, uh, in the reduction of the strain on the environment. And so the argument is, uh, so for example, when at home, I say to my family, why don't you turn out the light? Let's save some energy. I'm told, but it's an energy-saving light bulb. So that's the, uh, the effect of these, of, these, um, of these cases of technological uh, progress. A certain, uh, technolo there is technological progress, and then people change their behavior, and that eliminates the net gain um, in, in terms of um, the net ecological gain of this, uh, this um, progress. So someone uh, sa saves um, m money because they've um, refashioned their house to be more um, co uh, to conserve more energy, and then uses the money to travel to Jamaica with all of his family. Then it, th that eliminates the positive effect on the environment. So th what this means is you always have to look at the whole system. You have to look. You have to. We have to we have to see that there are certain measures that can be helpful in terms of this, such as absolute limits um, to um, the consumption of resources, pricing, the old debate on CO2 uh, taxes on CO2 emissions. These are instruments that can be used, and so our work group was actually successful in uh, in terms of its analysis, 
And this, notwithstanding the fact that the members of the Federal Democratic Party behaved in such an obstructionist manner, but when it came to proposing measures to be taken, that's where we had trouble agreeing. So we, we had a consensus in our analysis, but we couldn't agree on what measures we were going to recommend to address this problem. And the the um, Federal Democrat and Conservative uh, coalition of the time insisted that this was these were issues that had to be addressed on a global level um, by a, a global commission. And of course, we knew that, well, if that was what we were going to recommend, then nothing was going to happen effectively. And there was a kind of blockade um, by these uh, members of the Commission who were trying to prevent effectively uh, measures being adopted um, on the national level where it would have been possible to adopt them. And people from the ecological movement uh, uh, confirmed to me that, uh, th that this is in fact an insight that was achieved within the Parliamentary Commission that is worth um, worth remembering and worth passing on within the ecological movement. Namely, uh, it's, it's the insight that individual technological improvements are useless in and of themselves. They always need to be accompanied by political, economic, and social and cultural innovations. And it's uh, those innovations that make sure that technological improvements actually lead to a reduction in the consumption of resources. And that, I believe, is something that is also uh, one of the major issues here at this conference because what is really uh, important aside from technological improvements and something that's really uh, a key to the many initiatives that we have here is that uh, social and cultural, there are efforts to bring about social and cultural transformation and to to and it's it, we won't be able to reduce our um, the strain we put on the environment and our consumption of resources unless, unless we uh, we make changes in the immaterial realm of of the way we live and the values we adopt. So this is perhaps even a spiritual task, and it's the most difficult, the most challenging task, but also I think the most fruitful or rewarding task. And how will the great coalition? Um, that is governing today address um, this challenge. I have the impression that I'm the one who always gets asked the difficult questions. I don't want to talk my way out of this, but I have the impression, listening to the recent statements by our economic minister, um, I have the impression sometimes that the Social Democratic Party is the extension of the Federal Democratic Party by other means or the continuation. So life hasn't necessarily become easier, but there are two or three things I would like to emphasize that were uh, mentioned by Hermann Ott. I think one of the most interesting discussions that we had within the Parliamentary Commission was, aside from the discussion on, on the rebound effect, I think it was really two things. Uh, surprisingly, we agreed on the fact that one needs to think about, and this is something that needs to be openly said, one needs to think about um, prompting um, industry n not to um, access certain resources by by means of paying them pay by paying them not to uh, access certain resources. That's something that one 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 could do by means of a, well, that's something one could finance by means of a global uh, tax on financial transactions or something of the kind. And what I think is really surprising is that this was a consensus across the political parties represented in the Parliamentary Commission. Um, the other thing that's uh, mentioned in the report and that I think is important uh, the, the second point that uh, I thought was very exciting uh, is, is the question of whether Germany should play a the role of a pioneer. And that's a question that has, there are two aspects to this question. Hermann Ott always argued that we need to uh, do this in a way that, that we need to be pioneers and role models in terms of the way in which we go about um, organizing our economy. And 
others argued, well, yes, of course, um, we we need Germany to be a pioneer, but more with regard to technological innovation, so that we will we'll be in a position to um, provide other countries with our technological innovation so that they can avoid the mistakes that we have made. And I think that in these two uh, aspects, um, we never really, w with regard to these two aspects, we never really agreed. Uh, in spite of the fact that the work of the work group number three was um, very much uh, work that led to an overarching consensus. Now, w if you ask me somewhat provocatively what the um, governing co today's governing coalition is doing today, well, um, one of the not entirely surprising insights um, achieved by the Parliamentary Commission was that it's always easier for the political opposition to um, uh, defend certain positions, even though the political opposition knows that once it itself is in power, it won't be able to keep the promises promises it, it has made. And that's something that we can see in the case of the Social Democratic Party right now. Now that it's in power, it's, power, it's behaving in a different way than it was behaving when it was in the political opposition. And uh, I think that at the end of the day, that's almost a shame. I, I, I don't want to pretend that the Christian Democrat Party hasn't fallen into this trap, but but it's important that the German Parliamentary Commission um, dealt with issues that weren't part of part and parcel of the coalition agreement, and so it was able to, as it were, extend. It had a broader horizon, and it was able to uh, devote room to the 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 in intrinsic dynamic of normative discourses and discourses and it's something that I think one can expect from the German Bundestag the German Parliament is that they engage with this these with our findings in a constructive manner and sometimes that's been successful sometimes it hasn't uh, I'd like to repeat the repeat the question what would this mean uh, within the parliamentary faction of your party the Christian Democratic Party is there sympathy for caps for absolute limits on the use of certain resources is there sympathy for proposals such as attacks on using certain resources well we had uh, a discussion with Peter Altmaier a few days ago who um, is a key player in the Bundestag um, w with regard to these issues and who when he was environment environmental minister wasn't just interested in these questions but in fact passionate about them and he said we want to try to use the chancellery to no, or we in the chancellery, chancellery want to take a closer look at our policies to see what the eco their ecological consequences are, and I want to look more closely at what these measures would um, would mean. But the fact that um, he feels responsible for these questions is is a good sign. So good news. Uh, we'd like to hear good news, and of course we also like to hear what came of it later on. But that, of course, is the task of civil society. So we'll wait and see what um, the former environmental minister will go on to do. And I've also found out, um, and this may be relevant to people here in the auditorium, um, those of you who have uh, who are, who have the possibility of contacting MPs from the Social Democratic Party have the opportunity to ask them um, what uh, what has become um, of the promises of the promises they made when they were in the political opposition. I'd like to now uh, talk about the project group number five, which was the project group on the world of labor and on consumer behavior. Now. Um, you directed this um, project group. What do you think were the main results of its work? It's, of course, um, something that's a little more complicated than uh, uh, the, the, the set of problems that can be summarized by the word rebound. So I think uh, the work of this project group, the work the project group on labor issues and on consumer issues was uh, yielded more complex results. But um, I'd like to ask you um, what what the results, uh, in what way the results have been picked up on in other uh, parliamentary bodies. You've already mentioned that the work group on transportation hasn't really taken note of them at all. Um, do you think that the results of this um, project group's work 
um, will be uh, relevant to elsewhere. And also, uh, um, I remember there was a protest, um, uh, uh, mainly by women, um, concerning the composition of uh, the Parliamentary Commission, not not concerning the Parliamentary Commission as a whole, but concerning the advisors within the Commission. And they were all male, and that later on there was one woman. Did that uh, have an effect on the results and the findings um, of the project group on the world of labor, on consumer issues, and on issues of lifestyle. Um, was there more attention paid to issues such as the care economy uh, when there was a woman among the experts? What do you think, what can you say about the work of this project group group in terms of gender issues? Well, in this project group, on the one hand, we were addressing the themes that were ideally, or that would have been ideally suited to lead to concrete proposals uh, for actions, because both the theme of work and the theme of consumption are very close to the lived reality of people. Uh, and we also had very, very interesting hearings and uh, debates um, when we were addressing the theme of work. We had an expert opinion by Professor Zawa, who uh, presented to us uh, some of the problems, some of the catch-22 situations that employees find themselves in, because on the one hand, they're expected to work, work, and work even more. And on the other hand, the conditions uh, under which work is provided, for example, in the service sector, in the health sector, cannot really um, be shaped by the employees themselves. And so this leads to people suffering from the work that they're doing. And what also suffers is the quality of the work. And so, so we could have developed something out of our engagement with this problem. But of course, uh, the, these uh, themes are very much uh, controversial themes between the various political parties. So we had very constructive uh, debates on the question of what kind of concept of labor we want to employ. But there was great disagreement on what concept of labor should be employed. We, uh, we had uh, f um, expert opinions um, that we requested that were formulated from a feminist perspective. That's something that we requested as the left party faction uh, together with the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. That's something that has uh, become part of the final report of the Parliamentary Commission. We had a hearing with um, Adelheid Bizeka who addressed the issue of work and of care work. But there was no consensus within the Parliamentary Commission, or there was no majority of members who that was willing to consider the work in its entirety, and, and was willing to take seriously the fact that non-remunerated, unpaid work also needs to be considered a key aspect of social work in its entirety, or of the work performed in society overall. And then another uh, theme we addressed was how, what is it that makes consumers actually change the decisions that they make? There was a great deal of material that we considered and, and that we reflected on. We, we found that we have to inform people, we have to provide people with information so that they behave more ecologically when they're shopping. So that would one of the suggest one of the proposals we had was to put certain barcodes on commodities that people could access by means of their cell phones, their mobile phones. And there was also uh, the notion that politics is responsible for certain commodities never entering the market in the first place, that there should be a regulation prior to um, certain commodities being taken to market. And so that there should be a, a, that the, the overall um, um, that the set of available commodities should be such that people aren't put in a position where they may find themselves becoming complicit in the exploitation of other people and in the destruction of nature. But, but there were many uh, different uh, views um, on these issues in the Parliamentary Commission. We had a great deal of expert knowledge that, um, that, that 
um, that that we were able to to confront ourselves with, and that has informed the final report, which is why it's really worthwhile to read the final report of the project group number five. I'd like to mention one other issue. Um, I'd like to address one other issue. We we um, also uh, um, considered the problem of lifestyles, and we discovered the concept of sufficiency as a very important sort of key concept um, that n needs to be uh, needs to become um, part of the political field or of political discourse. And I think it was uh, very important that we were able to. Um, to discuss this issue of sufficiency rather than discussing only questions of efficiency, for example. So perhaps a brief remark on that. These debates on the predominance of efficiency led um, to the public publication of a book on sufficient the pol politics of sufficiency by Ude Schneidewind, where he says that we need to put more emphasis on sufficiency and we need to show that this is actually a political issue. I would like to ask you, Dr. Zimmer, uh, something uh, in a very modest way, it's not uh, 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 intended to be provocative. Is there something in your work group on work issues, issues and social issues, um, in, is there in that work group something that picks up on um, the findings of the project group number five? Well, Ma Matthias Sima is very much the representative of a modern cosmopolitan um, bourgeoisie, and he's very much. Um, is, uh, He's very much um, the representative of a, a, a Christian Democratic Party that is modernizing itself. Now, project group number five, which was led in a wonderful way by Sabine Leidig, was a project group that we all three of us were represented in, or were members of, and we had already garnered some experiences on what works and what doesn't work. We'd already developed um, a, a procedure that we called agreeing to disagree. So we decided to agree to disagree. So there's a great deal uh, of, uh, of, of um, information in the final report which um, isn't necessarily consensual. So, for example, everything in the report on the basic income proposal, it, these are not things that were uh, that everyone in the project group agreed on, but there was an agreement that everyone would be able to present their proposal. So we agreed to disagree. There were no recommendations of what should be done um, practically and, po po and politically, but but there was a, a, a presentation of possibilities of of questions concerning how uh, consumption could be made more sustainable. I'd like to uh, say something about that briefly. I think we all have the impression that the project group number five could easily have continued working for another year because we started a great deal later. Uh, so the, the project group number three lasted a little longer, and the project group number five didn't begin its work until the other two um, had f ended their work. So in the end, we only had one year to address these issues, and there was a general sense of discomfort or unease at the end that we weren't we hadn't really gone as far as we could have gone. Um, there was a, there would have been a, a great deal that we more that we could have um, done in terms of thinking about these issues. And so I think it would be very interesting to have a, a special parliamentary commission specifically on this issue. I proposed this once uh, within the Christian Democratic Party, but uh, no one has picked up on this suggestion yet, and we're far from uh, having reached a decision on this question. Um, when the, pro the the project group number five uh, didn't uh, try to develop grand schemes and 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 
uh, de develop, develop a kind of a vision of what work could be like in the middle of the 21st century. The, instead, the, the, the work group is very much concerned with um, repairing um, the damage uh, that is caused by the way the world of, of work is currently organized. So I think it would be very interesting to have a more uh, uh, principled debate on where the direction that work is moving in, how it is developing. Now, there, there's been a lot of debate on the consequences of industry 4.0, on the digitalization of industry. What are the consequences of that for production processes, but also for relations within production? the relations between employers and employees. These are issues that haven't really been uh, taken seriously yet in Parliament. We um, do talk about important issues such as the minimum wage and other issues, but the, the long-term shaping of the labor market is something that uh, we were not in a position to address. Thank you very much. So we've heard that in spite of the somewhat uh, um, limited results of the work of the Parliamentary Commission, you still feel that the instrument of, the par of Parliamentary Commissions is still seen by you as very important and that it would be important to have another Parliamentary Commission on, on the world of labor, on consumerism and on the theme of lifestyles. Thank you for your remark that uh, you, um, as, a, as a trio, as a group of three people, worked so well together. That's something that I think we've all um, uh, gained a sense of here this evening. But uh, surely there was some degree of, of disagreement and, and, and controversy as well. That's, um, there's, I want to ask a final question. What do you, what are you uh, betting on now that the hopes placed in the Parliamentary Commission haven't all been realized? How do we move forward when it comes to the themes of prosperity and quality of life? Where will the next impulses come from? From the political parties, from Parliament, from civil society, or from the world of academia, or from all of these? But what do you, where do you think the main impulses and the, the greatest uh, dynamism will come from in the f near future? Dr. Tsima, well, um, you can only ever speak for the field that you're, you're working in yourself. What I think is exciting, what I think is very uh, intriguing and interesting is the debate that is currently being conducted within the churches. There's also a discussion within the Catholic social doctrine on uh, sustainability. S sustainability as a form of solidarity is something that is being debated within the church, and I think there is a great deal of discussion on, of this issue in the church, and the criteria such as sufficiency also play a role in these debates. Uh, there's the idea that the man needs to rediscover his proper center and measure and um, find a sense of measure what uh, the last pope uh, wrote in in recent uh, in his publications is um is uh, very very uh, progressive um when one reads it one could think that it was written by someone some young person on the left and i i do hope that the christian democratic party will open itself up to ideas from christian social doctrine well my hope is based on the impulses coming from social movements on the one hand um, at conferences such as this one and at the on the other hand um, impulses coming from protests and um, concrete movements on the streets and i'm also 
uh, very optimistic in the possibilities of a, a sort of counter -hegemonic, hegemonic academic and scholarly landscape developing so that um, it's no longer just um, classical economists or neoliberal economists who are determining the discourse. I hope that the people assembled here, the, the people who are politically active, I hope that the people active in parliaments, I, I hope that people in the parliaments choose, don't choose to ignore politically active people such as the ones assembled here. I. I, I I was uh, formerly a member of ATTAC, and um, I think it was one of the weaknesses of ATTAC that there was a great deal of distance between this organization and uh, parliamentarians and parliament, and I think it would be important for all of us who are trying to develop this idea of degrowth in our various institutions, I think it would be, it would do us well to interact more. It, it would be important for m there to be more challenges and more uh, uh, demands and requests presented to political parties. This ki this way of debating with one another and of looking at the at the at the world in a different way. This is something that the political political parties I think need to open their eyes to. Or that needs to be presented to them because they are in a in a way they have a very limited view of the world. Uh, and but it would be important to not just write them off, but to continue trying to uh, change the way they see the world. Even while the Parliamentary Commission was still working, there was a process what we called crossover, which was initiated by um, the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. Members of the Parliamentary Commission got together with members of civil society. That was during the last 12 months, I think. There were three meetings, if I remember correctly. And back then, we already asked the questions of how do we continue? How do we follow up on this parliamentary commission? And we agreed that we need a civil society forum that can also pick up on the impulse, on the momentum that, that is gained here, for example. Because this is a place where representative of very different initiatives, groups, organizations come together and can develop concepts for the future development of society in order to make sure that there is a socio-economic transformation. I think this will be our task maybe for the coming 12 months to build such an alliance. I remember one crossover meeting where Christa Wichirich attended and she, sa she said, well, this is the third growth a debate that I've seen and it's going to result in, it's going to have the same result as the other one. It's simply going to be forgotten. And I think to make sure that it is not forgotten, we really need a platform. We need institutions and Agora or whatever you want to call it that creates a, an opportunity for civil society, for politicians, media, and the scientific community to have an exchange to advance ideas, to make interventions into the current political sphere and work. And this is what I want to support in the future. Thanks very much for this very practical proposal. And thanks very much to our panelists in general. And of course, we still regret that Daniela Kolbe cannot be with us on the panel. She still seems to be stuck on a train somewhere, although according to the information we have, she should be here by now. And well, you can complain at the Deutsche Bahn if you want to. But now we'll open up the debate and we'll give you the possibility to make comments, to raise questions, and I think I will start on this side and then continue on the other side. And please, please speak into the microphone. Please just wait for one second, especially for translation reasons.
Thank you very much. First of all, we've discussed a lot of interesting issues so far at this conference, but we also felt that there's very few politicians participating here. And I wonder, does that reflect the political attitude towards this conference? And please, the person behind you. Two very short questions. Mr. Zimmer, you were talking about the church. At the beginning of the year, I attended the Ecumenical Assembly in Mainz. And it was said that we shouldn't talk about sustainability so much anymore, but really about a paradigm shift moving away from the concept of growth. And um, do you see any support for this in your CDU party? And the second question to all three panelists. It's also the financial markets and the concept of uh, interest and compound interest that keeps driving the idea of growth and ever more growth. So why don't we talk about that, our monetary system and our financial system, which we need to change as well in order to do away with the engine that drives the concept of growth. Here at the front, please. Here in the second row. In the fifth. My name is Matthias Weiland. I'm working in the Federal Office for Environmental Issues. You mentioned a disagreement between the experts in the, on the Parliamentary Commission. But the example you gave suggested to me that within the parliamentary groups, there was also a lot of disagreement. So could the Green Party not have joined the leftist party in their efforts to develop a different set of indicators, whether, whether it be three or four indicators? But you could have come up maybe with with an indicator that could have lasted a bit longer than the set of indicators you now came up with and which doesn't seem to last very long. My name is Peter Nowak. I want to say GDP as an indicator for prosperity is not at all suitable because Brutto does not equal netto. The gross product doesn't equal the net product. In this whole structure of products, we include also consumption goods. And not in, but I don't think we should include any other goods. We should just include consumption goods and consumption services. There's the idea that if the economy goes well, then prosperity goes up, so they or vice, vice versa. But we also see that in the case of natural disasters, sometimes they have an effect on on growth and the the economic development. So, do you think these considerations do these considerations influence your perception of growth? So, uh, would you like to answer the question about the church, please? So, let's start with the first question of about the attendance of, of politicians. Uh, because this topic does not drive a political career, so you really have to be passionate about this topic. 
if you if you want to join here, I think this holds true for um, for most political parties, not just mine. The question about growth. Well, we saw what happened in 2010. We started our work in the Parliamentary Commission, and then the uh, crisis in Greece came about. And what was the the perceived method of fighting the 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 crisis in Greece? It was striving for more growth. So we are kind of trapped in a mechanism that becomes self-perpetuating. And it seems impossible to build, to break up this mechanism because the question of, of sufficiency or of moderation, as I would call it, is always seen as being equal with foregoing things, not not accepting not to have things or to get things. Whereas you have to make clear to people that this does not always equal a loss. Christoph Winsheimer has written a couple of publications on the topic I want to talk about now. I think it's it's uh, very fascinating that he worked together with Joe Ackerman, by the way, and helped him in his um, dissertation. And I, th and I think there was a working group on that on the Humboldt University in Berlin that really looked into these matters, but I wasn't really convinced by their findings. I think All of these questions that were raised, raised even by Silvio Gesellde at the beginning of the 20th century, I think they're very interesting from a historic point of view. But in our economic reality, they are not of much use, or they cannot be enforced. On some other panel, or in a discussion with somebody else, I already when do more detail about this issue, this issue but which I can't do tonight because time is too short. So can I ask you the question of why couldn't you agree on one indicator? I, that wasn't the question I wanted to answer right now. Well, who else could answer this question? Well, we might have been able to achieve this, but I don't think it would have changed much. I, what I wanted to say is that I found it exciting to see how, as opposition parties, we managed to have a minority vote, which was not easy. There was a long debate about this. I want to say something on the question of um, the monetary system, compound interest, and so on. I agree with Matthias Simmers. From my point of view also, this is not really the main issue. What took place on the capital markets over the last 20 years is actually the development of a new monetary system. Because what's being traded there now didn't even exist 20 years ago, We're talking about derivatives and the such. But I don't think this is the central point here, really. It's more about capital and how we use capital. Take, for example, a car production site. It does not only have to be profitable, but it also has to be competitive, produce more cars at a cheaper price than car factories in, say, Italy. And the same holds true for uh, food processing plants, for example. Uh, everything has to be profitable. And this is a kind of growth dynamic results from the way we do business. And this cannot be changed by simply changing our monetary system. I think we really have to talk to the people driving growth in our society in order to tackle this question. 
this is also about the goods that we really need. So not just producing goods because we can produce them and it drives growth, but producing the goods that we really need and want. I think this is the core of the issue. I do believe that our monetary system does play an important role, especially the idea of compound interest. There was a very interesting event by, by the GLS bank revolving around the monetary summit. And I have to say it quite opened my eyes. Hans-Christoph Binswanger was invited but the professors present there, especially coming from the government coalition, didn't really let him talk. But I think this is one of the aspects that the Parliamentary Commission failed to discuss about. Why are not more politicians present here? Well, I, th I think Daniela Kalbe and me both had the idea to join s or to have to organize such an event um, as this one. And the organizers of this event then asked us to join them and not have two separate events. You have to understand that politicians usually like to be at the center of attention. So if you invite them, I'm sure they're going to come. I'm sure they're going to be here. Just invite them, put pressure on them, and keep keep up the pressure. And then there was the question why the Green Party and the Leftist Party didn't join forces in order to come up with a common set of indicators. Well, the two sets of indicators that we came up with are very similar. And the point of why we couldn't agree in the end is maybe just due to the human factor, so to say. I didn't have that much influence in the Parliamentary com Commission, despite my, com my position. And it's difficult to make sure that, that people find common ground. And the question about GDP, of course, the, our work at the Parliamentary Commission was very much influenced by this idea. There was one session of the Parliamentary Commission where almost all members of the Parliamentary Commission sp spoke out against one member of the FDP party and put so much pressure on him that in the end he had to admit that, okay, the GDP as a growth indicator is not enough. And this really motivated us then. But of course now I am disappointed that in in everyday government work, this does not really play a role. So I'm focusing on the right-hand side now, right at the top there. And then Felix Eckert after that, sitting a couple of rows before our first speaker. I don't want to be too provocative here. I'm anti-fascist, but I'm also talking to fascists, which is not always liked by my friends. And when I talk to them, what I hear is that they find that the system is guided by lobbyists. And I think this is a problem because both the fascist and the leftist parties at the moment are questioning the system. And both sides say that the neoliberal regime has failed. Both want social peace, whereas one side, the, the left-wing side, is more nationalist and of course also questions democratic legitimization. We saw elections in Saxony recently, and if you look at, it, at the results closely, then you will find that 
the political legitimization is actually down to 30 percent, roughly. So could you come to, to the question you want to raise? Sigmar Gabriel said the Democratic parties could really should really get together and work on a strategy of how to find a democratic solution. So I'd like to call on you to join him in that call. Because I think the election results in Saxony have really shown us that there really is a problem. Thank you very much for this call that, as you pointed out, is a very justified one here in Saxony. But now a question, please, by Felix Eckert. My name is Felix Eckert. Felix Eckert. I'm researching on sustainability, but I'm also dealing with environmental issues. And the question was raised of why politicians do not always deal with this topic as much as we'd like. But I think this is a question that we as a whole society should ask ourselves. I don't think that growth criticism is more widespread in society than it is in politics. I think politics reflect civil society and vice versa. They're interrelated. So I think it's, it's, it's not enough to call on the politicians to do the work. About the finding of findings of the Parliamentary Commission, I think it's quite easy to ignore those findings, first of all, because the report is so long, and second of all, because there seems to be great inconsistency in that report. So there seems a kind of patchwork of, of combined proposals that are not, and it's not always um, possible to, um, to reconcile all those different, different proposals. And for all those who might not be that interested in the topic anyway, I think it's going to discourage them from reading the report. What I find mo most difficult is something that I think you didn't deal enough with, and that is to show that because of certain environmental restrictions, ecological restrictions, we won't be able to avoid a degrowth strategy sooner or later. And I think solutions won't be that easy to find here, not as easy as my friend Nico Pech maybe suggests. And I think we need to go into much more detail here. What exactly could s a new system look like? It's not enough to just talk about shorter working hours maybe. So maybe over here, a question over here. I think one important aspect in the work of the Parliamentary Commission is that it established a counter power to the permanent perception of the GDP as a parameter for measuring growth. I think it would have been great if you had achieved this. You agreed on, more or less agreed on 25 warning signals and indicators in the report. And if, for example, what about you gave these indicators to a scientific researcher and asked him to develop them and forge them into one common indicator? something the government and the Parliamentary Commission obviously did not manage to do. And then Amy Seidel, please, here at the front. Maybe two comments. 
I think the Parliamentary Commission's report seems to be interesting, especially for MPs. But what I'm asking myself is what you have created, is it, is it really useful? Will it really advance the idea of a degrowth society? Or are these rather general comments that you made in the report? And then, just because I'm interested in knowing that myself personally, do you think there was enough innovative forces and imagination to really imagine and uh, advance, advance this idea of a po of a degrowth society. I think a lot of institutions and regimes would have to change if we want such a society. Have you also thought about different sectors like the health sector, the insurance companies, many other actors, and how to include them? because I think it is important to include them if we want to move towards degrowth. We have not had any questions so far in the comments, so maybe we can accept two more comments and see if any questions arise. My name is Kobas Kobun. I think this panel discussion is very, very interesting and it's important to not forget the work that has been done and try to advance the work so from the point of view of a scientific research institution, I think the Parliamentary Commission's report is very much worthwhile reading because in a lot of aspects, what has been found is that there's too little information available. More research needs to be done. It has been asked that economic researchers come up with concepts and ideas. But I'd like to tell the, um, the responsible politicians then that this, uh, that uh, research needs funding. You attribute a lot of funding to research that um, deals with the question of how to, how to continue with the current growth regime. And there's almost no research initiatives that try to explore the path of a, of a degrowth society, at least none that go beyond analysis, none that really develop strategies. At the moment, we are conducting a study on growth neutral companies, so, so companies that do not grow. And we had to, it took us, took us a long time to find somebody to fund us. And then we were funded at such poor conditions that it almost makes me cry. I think the political system as a whole needs to deal, we need to go into these questions further and there, and it needs to change to do that. So. Looking at my watch, I see that we cannot continue this discussion much more, but there's two people who've kept raising their arm because they want to ask a question. I, I think we'll give the floor to just those two because they obviously insist to ask their questions. Thanks very much for allowing me to speak. One question. I know you've already dealt with this question a little bit, the question of why do not many politicians deal with this topic, and you said that it doesn't help to advance your career. Well, then I can just tell you maybe you need a bit more motivation. Are there any plans for setting up a new commission that could look into the question of how to incorporate these issues into the current political agenda. I have a question for Mr. Zimmer as the representative of a government governing party. You were even a little proud in looking back on your work in the commission. 
But just a second later, you said, well, and then we were back to our daily political work. Now, there's one issue that, that has dominated the headlines of newspapers for weeks now. Why do politicians waste their precious time on a topic like the, um, the road toll in Germany instead of dealing with such an important topic that as the one that we've raised tonight. I think I'll give you the floor to answer that question immediately. Well, this is a highly interesting event, I think. There's criticism on lobbyism on the one hand, and then there's somebody else standing up and asking for, for more funding. So I think there are certain contradictions even here in this room. No, I don't mean that one aspect excludes the other aspects. They, they can probably be reconciled, but the question is how. So about the question of the road tag, road toll. Well, you'd maybe have to ask that question, um, ask a member of the um, Commission on Traffic and Transport this question. What I had to deal with in my parliamentary work was mainly the legal minimum wage, for example, something that we've discussed a lot about over the last couple of months. So to continue work on a topic that lacks an institutional platform, like the parliamentary commission, is almost impossible. And I want to make one more comment. What do we do with the findings? This question was being raised. I thought it would be ideal if our findings regarding the indicators would be used to, in the debate about the, um, the official indicator set by the government coalition. I think there's three important reports every year, which is the report on environment, on social policy, and on economic policy. And I think they should be summed up in a way, summed up in a way that also includes the these new sets of indicators. Because then we would make use of the set of indicators that we developed in the Parliamentary Commission. And let me talk on one last issue. The Parliamentary Commission was not a degrowth commission. It was not its task to explore path of how to develop a degrowth society. It did do what it was asked to do, and it was asked to explore the question of what is the v of the value of uh, growth in society. With regard to many questions, we didn't reach consensus. When we did reach consensus. However, we cannot say that there was one scientific truth, so to say, that was then generally accepted. I think it was difficult to find consensus in many aspects, because especially in the working group led by Hermann Ott, but also the one led by Sabine, there was a real effort to at least reach, reach a minimum consensus. And we know that a minimum consensus is not sexy. It would be much easier to pretend that we had found a great consensus. But we really did try to do honest work and rather agree on a minimum consensus than agree on none.
and we can only hope that one day it'll have an effect on society, like we hope that the report will have an effect on society. So I can only agree here to say that it was not our starting point to say we need a degrowth concept. Nevertheless, I want to underline that the, the concept of degrowth is really being dealt with. We have in Europe some economies that do shrink at the moment. And of course, people relate to that. And people try to make sure to save certain certain branches, like the financial markets, for example. But this is not simply guaranteed by civil society. It's a certain concept of how to deal with shrinking growth. But from my perspective, this is the exact opposite of what a degrowth concept should look like, because degrowth actually aims at improving living conditions for everyone. In the case of Southern Europe, this would mean putting redistribution issues at the center of the debate. How can we make sure that the insurance system is being kept up in Greece? How we can we make sure that jobs being lost through the urbanization are in some way regained? And I think this makes one thing very clear. Degrowth does not just mean dealing with shrinking growth in some way, but dealing with it in a certain way. I think the report by the Parliamentary Commission could come useful in the future, because at least we have developed a list of issues that more research should, should be done on by universities, for example. And this enables us to um, apply with the current government to, to, to establish such working groups. You remember Horst Seehofer doing his electoral campaign. This is one thing. But the other thing is that there are very concrete plans to um, privatize the traffic and transportation sector. I'm talking about public-private partnerships here. And of course, a private actor will not um, invest unless there's profits. And uh, I think the road toll can, can help with this issue. So I think the issue is maybe of bigger importance than we realized. And the last point, lobbyism. I think there's great qualitative differences between those who very systematically pay people for um, advancing their ideas in, in policies and those who are, are sitting here asking for a little more funding for their research project. I, th I think we cannot compare those two. But with regard to what's been said that people are tired of politics, I think the whole degrowth debate also has a lot to do with the debate about democracy. Who actually decides on our lifestyle? Who decides on our living conditions? And I think we want a lifestyle that does not 
disable others to lead the life that they want as well. And this won't work without democracy. So I think these aspects are interrelated. So I think people's frustration is reflected in politics. Um, I also want to uh, defend uh, Thomas Kog Mas Kogun. We weren't dealing with any sorts of dialectic there. He was simply calling for an up-to-date research policy, and that, of course, is simply the duty of any German government. It is, in fact, a major failure of the government not to conduct such an up-to-date research policy when it comes to funding research projects. There were there were two attempts from by Felix Eckert and Ingo Seidel who asked us about proposals that were made um, during the last legislative period, and it's important to no, to look not just at what the majority vote was, but also what the opposition said. And it's important to look at what was said there when it comes to, for example, the issue of socio-ecological transformation. And there are 10, 15 pages in this report that would be a very uh, 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 that are very revealing as to what would be needed to promote socio-ecological transformation in Germany. There is the oppositional vote um, by the project group number three, where we present um, on several pages what would be needed in order to order to achieve a decoupling of the consumption of resources from economic activity. So it's important to look not just at the findings of the Parliamentary Commission as a whole, but also to look at the minority opinions as they are documented in the report. And of course, um, the Parliamentary Commission was uh, qu uh, intended to be, from the start, uh, to be growth critical. It was an idea that came from the Green Party, um, it's a Green Party Party member who proposed um, setting up such a commission, and we then sat down together with the Social Democratic Party, and then of course we also had to agree with the coalition at the time. So that means mainly with the Christian Democratic Party, and then of course there were a lot of uh, cuts that were made and, and and things that were deleted from the original mandate of the Parliamentary Commission, or from the report rather. But the overall trend, the tendency, and the motivation was a critical one. It was a, a matter of critically questioning what growth means to our society and how uh, one um, can uh, deal with this. And we've uh, stressed the failures of um, this parliamentary commission, um, and and we and the f the fact that it hasn't. Uh, there, there, there are a, a number of, of gaps um, in what the in the work of the parliamentary commission. It would be important to fill them in, and so it would be important to look at the question of research uh, as well. Perhaps my colleague Dr. Zimmer uh, um, could uh, have a word with um, a minister from his party. I believe her name is Vanka. Whether and ask her whether it wouldn't perhaps be time to implement a research program that continues the work of the Parliamentary Commission, but also um, works towards what is currently demanded within civil society and within the scientific community. I think that's something that we would all welcome and we would all uh, support Dr. Tsimma in, in doing that. I believe that was a good concluding statement, don't you think? Well, uh, in conclusion, I'd like to say um, I was. we were all glad to have a very well-informed discussion on the findings of the Parliamentary Commission, a realistic assessment that did, that did not attempt to idealize the Parliamentary Commission or to um, present uh, its publication, its final report as the path-breaking publication for the degrowth, degrowth movement. Uh, it was good that you pointed out about the, 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 the faults and the failures of the Parliamentary Commission, and it was good for you to present it as 
a marker um, um, of, of ways in which the debate within civil society might be extended. I think it's probably not disrespectful to say that the report can be used as a sort of source of working materials. And even if uh, the aspirations of many, um, the, the, or the hopes that many put in the Parliamentary Commission have not all been fulfilled, I think it's worth continuing to pursue uh, the questions the Parliamentary Commission has dealt with, both within Parliament and without, and it may be useful to remember what um, was discussed in a, uh, with a, a view to long-term trends and to um, bring these long term the long term perspective into one's everyday work or to let it inform one's everyday work i think it also become clear however that these sorts of great tasks uh tasks such as um thinking about the way to a sustainable economy these are not themes um that can be uh that can simply be left to a parliamentary commission it's really a task um that requires many, many participants, and I hope that we'll have a, a, a good ex uh, a continuation of the debate and of our work in research projects, in concrete pro uh, projects at, on the local level. I hope to see you soon. Many thanks, and thank you to the chairperson. <laughs> And a warm welcome to Daniela Kolbe, who's uh, who's arrived just now to see. What